studying the Bible and studying church history is an absolute fantastic journey. We're on page 354 in John T. Christian's The History of the Baptist. America is headed for a revival after going down in the dumps. Seems like nations go like that and then dive down and come back up and dive down and come back up. Just like a graph. On page 354, we're beginning to see a revival in America. Under such preaching as this, it's no wonder that men were stirred to the depths of their souls. You know, in Catholicism and Presbyterian, all of this, they go through their little sermons, they have their Eucharist and, and, uh, or their Lord's Supper or Communion, and they go home. But the preaching of the Bible is a very powerful tool. Among these men, means adopted by the zealous pastor to awaken the flock was written a covenant binding all who appended their signatures to observe a monthly fast, a twilight concert of prayer, a con and a sunrise concert, and in a year in 1799 witnessed a renewal of the excitement but it reached its height in 1800 and 1801. In a letter to a friend dated to Logan County, Kentucky, October 21st, 1801, McGreedy gives a, a narrative of the commencement of progress of the revival in 1800. Now, I want you to understand something here. These people got involved in the charismatic movement before the charismatic movement got involved. This is where it begins in America. But I promise to give you a short statement of the blessed revival on which you will at once say that the Lord has done great things for us in the wilderness. The solitary place has been, or been made glad, the desert has rejoiced and blossomed as a rose. In the month of May 1797, which was the spring, after I came to this country, the Lord generously visited Casper River Congregation, an infant church then under my charge. The doctrines of regeneration, faith, and repentance of which I uniformly preached seemed to call attention to the people to serious in inquiry. In other words, it's important that you listen. During the winter, the question was often proposed to me, is religion a sensible thing? If I were converted, would I feel it and know it? In May, as I said before, the work began. A woman who had been a professor in full communion with the church found her old hope false and delusive. She was struck with a deep conviction and in a few days was filled with joy and peace and believing. She immediately visited her friends and relatives from house to house and warned them of danger in, in a most solemn, faithful manner and plead with them to repent and seek religion. This is a means that was accompanied by divine blessing to the awakening of many about this time, and the ears of all the congregation seemed to be open to receive the word preached, and almost every sermon was uh, accompanied by with the power of God in the awakening of the sinners. During the summer, about ten persons in the congregation were brought to Christ. In the fall of the year, general deadness seemed to creep in again. Conviction and conversion work in the great measure uh, ceased and no visible alteration for the better took place until the summer of 1798. And at the administration of the sacrament of the supper, which was in July, on Monday the Lord graciously poured out His Spirit. A very general awakening took place. Perhaps, but in the few families in the congregation could be found who less or more were not struck with an awful sense of their lost estate. Now, people went to church, people. People went to church lost and saved at this time. People went to church for entertainment. Cheap people went to church for 
uh, by compulsion. If you didn't go to church, you were fined, and if you didn't tithe, you were fined also again. Now, this is back in the period of time when uh, we didn't quite have total, absolute separation of the church and state. During the week following, but a few persons attended to the worldly business, and their attention to the business of their souls was so great that on the Sabbath of September, and we're talking about Sunday, uh, the Sabbath is not Sunday, Sabbath is Saturday, but they called this the, Sabbath, the Sunday Sabbath, Sunday the Sabbath because the Catholic Church demanded so. And it rubbed off on uh, Protestants. The sacrament was, a, was it administered. Now, the sacrament, as they're talking about here, is a vehicle of grace. And the, the Lord's Supper in Baptist Church is not a vehicle of grace. It is a remembrance of the Lord. You're remembering the Lord. That's what it is. It's an ordinance. And it's a remembering. It carries with it no vehicle of grace at all. We are remembering our Lord. On the Sabbath of September, the sacrament was administered at Muddy Creek, one of my congregations. At the meeting, the Lord graciously poured forth His Spirit in the awakening of many careless sinners. Through these two congregations already mentioned, and through Red River, my other congregation, awakening work went on with the power under every sermon. The people seemed to hear for eternity. In every house and almost every company, the whole congregation with people was about this, the state of their souls. And about this time, the Reverend J.B. came here and found uh, Mr. R. to join him. In a little while, he involved our infant churches in confusion, disputation, etc., and opposed the doctrines preached here, ridiculed the whole work of the revival, formed a considerable party, etc., etc. In a few weeks, it seemed to put a final stop to the whole work, and our infant congregation remained in a state of deadness and darkness from the fall through the winter and until the month of July in 1799. At the administration of the sacrament at Red River, this was a very solemn time throughout. On Monday, the power of God seemed to fill the congregation. The boldest, the daring sinners in the country covered their faces and wept bitterly. After the congregation was dismissed, a large number of the people stayed about the doors. The people in, in the meeting house again to perform prayer with them. According, we went in and joined prayer and exhortation. The mighty power of God came amongst us like a shower from the everlasting hills. God's people were quickened and comforted. Yes, some of them were filled with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Sinners were powerfully alarmed and some precious souls were brought to feel the pardoning love of Jesus at Jasper River. At the same time, under the care of Mr. Rankin, a precious instrument in the hands of God, the sacrament was administered in August. This was one of the days in the Son of Man. Indeed, especially on Monday, I preached the plain gospel message on Hebrews 11 and the better, and the better country. A great solemnity continued during the sermon. And after the sermon, Mr. Raymond Rankin gave a solemn exhortation and the congregation was then dismissed. But the people all kept their seats for a considerable place. And while awful solemnity appeared to the countenances of a large majority, presently several persons under deep conviction broke forth in a loud cry. Many fell to the ground and lay powerless, groaning and praying and crying for mercy. As I passed through the multitude, a woman lying in awful distress called me to her. She said, I lived in your congregation in Carolina. I was a professor and often went to the communion. But I was deceived. I have no religion. I am going to hell. In another place, an old gray-headed man lay in agony and distress addressing his weeping wife and children in such language as this, we are all going to hell together. We have lived prayerless, ungodly lives, and the work of our souls is yet to begin, and we must get religion 
or we will be all damned. But time would fail me to mention every instance of this kind. At Muddy Creek, the sacrament was administered in September. The power of God was gloriously present in the occasion. The circumstances is, are all, of it are all equal, if not superior to those in Casper River. Many souls were solemnly awakened, a number we hope converted, whilst the people of God feasted on the hen manna with property, propriety, might be said to sing the new song. But the year of 18, 1800 exceeded all that my eyes had ever beheld before. All that I have related to it only as it were a introduction. Although many souls in, in these congregations during the three years have been savingly converted and now give living evidence of their union with Christ, yet all the work is like only a few drops before the mighty rain. When compared with the wonders of the Almighty Grace that took place in the year 1800. In June, the sacrament was administered at Red River. This was the greatest time we ever had seen before. On Monday, multitudes were struck down under an awful conviction and the cries of the distress filled the whole house. <clears throat> there you might see profane swearers and Sabbath breakers pricked to the heart, crying out, What shall we do to be saved? The frolickers and dancers are crying for mercy. There you might see little children of 10, 11, 12 years old of age praying and crying for redemption. And in the blood of Jesus, in agonies of distress during this sacrament and until the Tuesday following, Ten persons, we believe, were savingly brought home to Christ. <clears throat> in July, the sacrament was administered in Casper River Congregation. Here, multitudes crowded from all parts of the country to see the strange work. Now, here we have like the tent revivals that I went to when I was a young boy. A young boy. Here multitudes crowded from all parts of the country to see the strange work and from a distance of 40, 50, even 100 miles, and this is by foot and horseback now, and wagon, whole families came in their wagons. Between and 20 or 30 wagons were brought to the place and loaded with people and their provisions in order to encamp at the meeting house. On Friday nothing more appeared during the day than a decent, decent solemnity. On Saturday, matters continued on the same way until that evening. Two pious women were sitting together conversing about their exercises, which conversion seemed to affect some of the bystanders, and instantly the divine flame spread to the whole congregation. Presently, you might have seen the sinners lying powerless in part of the house and praying and crying for mercy. Ministers and private Christians were kept busy during the the night, conversing with the distressed. The night, this night, a godly number of awakened souls were delivered from, by sweet, believing views of glory, fullness, and sufficiency of Christ to save to the eldermost. I'm going to tell you something now. The devil is never busy. He's never silent. Even in the greatest revivals, he brings error into God's churches, and there's some error here. And it noted later on, they just go on about all of this great emotion that these people are. Life were changed. They were actually coming to Christ, but then the devil creeps in with all this emotion. And the slaying in the spirit, and the crying out and talking in foreign languages, etc. Or unknown languages. Among these were some children, a striking proof of the religion of Jesus. Of many instances of which I have been an eyewitness, I shall only mention one, a little girl. I stood by her while she lay across her mother's lap, almost in despair. I was conversing with her when the first gleam of light broke upon her mind. She started to her feet and in ecstasy of joy cried out, Oh, he is willing, oh, he is willing, he is come, he is come, oh, what a sweet Christ he is. Oh, what a precious Christ he is. Oh, what a fullness I see in him. 
Oh, what a beauty I see in him. Oh, why was it I never could believe that I never could come to Christ before and when Christ was so willing to save me? Then turning around, she addressed sinners and told them of the glory of the willingness and the preciousness of Christ and pled with them to repent. And all of this language is so heavenly and at the same time so rational and scriptural that I was filled with astonishment. But were I to write every particular of this kind I have been an eye, with, eye and ear witness to during the past two years, it would fill many sheets of paper. At this sacrament, great many people from Cumberland, particularly from Shiloh congregation, came with great curiosity to see the work. Yet, prepossessed with strong prejudice against it, and about five of whom I trust were savingly and powerfully converted before they left the place. A circumstance worthy of observation. They were sober professors in full communion. What it means sober professors in full communion is that they were church members of some congregation and they could take the Lord's Supper with that or the communion or what you might say the sacrament as they called it because it was a vehicle of grace. I was truly affected to see them lying, powerlessly crying for mercy and speaking to their friends or relations in such a language as this. Oh, we despise the work we heard of in Logo in Logan. But oh, were we deceived. I have no religion. I know now that there is a reality in these sayings three days ago. I would have despised any person that I would have behaved as I am now behaving. But oh, I feel the very pains of hell in my soul. This is the language of the precious soul just before the hour of deliverance came. When they went home, their conversation to their friends and their neighbors was a means of commencing a glorious work that has overspread all the Cumberland settlements and the, and the conversion of hundreds of precious souls. Now we're talking about Presbyterian churches now. Presbyterian churches, they, they knew that they were the elect and they went to church, they took communion and everything, but in many of these churches there was no conversion in their lives. But now there's a little more of that with a little excess of emotionalism. The work continued night and day at this sacrament. While the vast multitude continued upon the ground till Tuesday morning, according to the best com computation, we believe that 45 souls were brought to Christ in this occasion. Muddy River Sacrament and all its circumstances we was equal and in and, and, and some regard superior to that of Gasper River. The sacrament was in August. We believe about 50 persons at the time obtained religion. Remember, these people are church members. At Ridge, sac at Ridge the sacrament in Cumberland, the second Sabbath in September, about 45 souls, we believe, obtained religion. At Shiloh sacrament, the third Sabbath, in September, about 70 souls. At Mr. Craighead Sacrament Congregation in Logan County, in October, eight precious souls. At Little Muddy Creek Sacrament in November, about 20 persons. At Montgomery Meeting House in Cumberland, about 40. At Hopewell Sacrament in Cumberland, there were about 20 persons. To mention the circumstances of a more private occasion, common days of preaching, and societies w would swell to a letter to a volume. People came from all over to see this great excitement that was taking place, this great revival. The present season has been blessed season likewise, yet not equal to last year in conversion work. I shall just give you a list of our sacraments and in the number we believe express religion at each during the present of 1801. Here the list is of the sacraments and the statement of 144 servants, persons professed religion. These are church members. 144 people were converted. 
I would just remark that among the great numbers of our country that profess to obtain religion, I scarcely know an instance of any that gave comfortable ground of hope to the people of God that they had religion and had been admitted to the privileges of the church. That's the Lord's Supper and the communion of the church, okay? And that have in any degree disgraced their profession or given any ground to doubt their religion. Were I to mention to you that the rapid progress of the work in vacant congregations, carried on by means of a few supplies and by praying societies, as in Stone River or Cedar Creek, Goose Creek, the Red Banks, the Fountainhead, and many other places, it would be more than time or the bounds of this letter would admit. Of Mr. M.G. and myself, administered the sacrament at Red Banks on the Ohio about a month ago, a vacant congregation nearly a hundred miles distant from any regular organized society, formerly a place famed for wickedness and perfect synagogue of Satan. I visited them twice at an early period, and Mr. R. twice and Mr. H. twice. These supplies the Lord blessed, and as means to start his work, and their praying societies were attended with the power of God to the conversion of almost whole families. When we administered the sacrament, among them, they appeared to be the most blessed little society I ever saw. Obtained ten elders among them, all precious Christians, and three of which two years ago were professed deist. Now, let's talk about this for just a moment. When I was at Valley Baptist Church, people came to church just to be around women. Men did, and men around women. It was a, what, a meat market, what you might say, in many ways. Men were looking for women, and women were looking for men. Now, people went there that were totally theologically unsound, but they were looking for a partner. Men and women. Morally, the men were the most unsound. Women were quiet about what they believed, but the men weren't. They came to my classes because I was in a single class at that time, and this was 20 years ago or more. They would hound the pastors and try to convert the pastors to their hellish doctrines and ideas. And they would come to me and they'd say, Brother Jim, can you try to get these people theologically straightened out at all, please? And I said, well, I just preach. That's what I do. Now, some of them I told they didn't belong there, and they left because they didn't belong there. They just simply did not believe. But now, in this congregation, I obtained ten elders among them, all precious Christians, three of which two years ago were professed deists. A deist is somebody who believes in a deity, but not in a personal God. Not in miracles, not in Jesus Christ, or anything else. Now, living monuments of the Almighty Grace. It's, a wonder, it's, it's wonderful that they were saved. I saw all this among people. Uh, sometimes uh, I had a Catholic come to church one time to, to rake me over the coals because his wife and children had become believers and they were baptized again because they were baptized when they were babies. And he came to tell me off. He got into that church and we were preaching on the, the family and the head of the family, how the man was a bit, being responsible for the salvation and the upbringing of his children, and he, he was drunk. He came to church drunk. He had a little bit of what we call a liquid encouragement. At the end of that service, he hit the, the altar and asked God to save his soul. And he came forward for baptism. That happened. But there wasn't any great emotion there. There was tears. There were, you know, there was happiness and everything, but not like what's going on here. The posthumous works of uh, James M. McGreedy. The regular camp meeting, as has been seen, was held in Gasper River in 1800. 
much pains was taken to advertise the meeting and it was announced that the people were expected to come and encamp on the grounds that the whole community and ministers especially were earnestly invited to attend and witness the wonderful scene which was about to happen. Now here we have the fire baptized Methodists. You know the Pentecostal church didn't become a Pentecostal, it was, it was Presbyterian and now Methodist. Fire baptized Methodists. People in congregations were not saved. And with great emotion, they came to Christ and the exaggeration of the Spirit of God took place. Impelled by curiosity and great concourse assembled from distance as far as a hundred miles. A regular encampment was formed. Some uh, occupied tents while others uh, slept in covered wagons. The whole was arranged to form a hollow square, the interior of which was, was fitted for public worship. Near the center was a stand, a rude platform or temporary pulpit constructed of logs, uh, surmounted by a handrail. The meeting lasted four days and, and pungent conviction for sin was followed by relief from the, in faith in Christ. Barton W. Stone, the then a Presbyterian minister who was present at the meeting in Logan County, describes as follows. There on the edge of the prairie in Logan County, Kentucky, the multitudes came together and continued a number of days and nights and camped on the ground during which time worship was carried on in some part of the encampment. The scene was new to me, and passing, uh, passing to be strange, it baffled my description. Many, very many fell down as men slain in battle and continued for hours together in an apparently breathless and motionless state sometimes for a few moments reviving and exhibiting symptoms of life by a deep groan and piercing shriek. Or by a prayer for mere mercy fervently uttered. After lying there for hours, they obtained deliverance. I'm going to tell you something. When you come to Jesus Christ and you confess your sins to Him and you ask Him to save your soul, it's instantaneously. Now, people may moan and groan. I know people that that uh, that's just doubt their salvation and they and they ask God to save them every day almost and God saved them once forever a pox young Tony on Tony on after laying there for hours they have changed deliverance the gloomy cloud that had been covered their faces seemed to turn to joy they were they would rise shouting deliverance and then they would address the surrounding multitude in language truly elegant and impressive with wonderful works of God and the glorious mysteries of the gospel. Their appeals were solemn, heart-penetrating, bold, and free. Under such circumstances, many others would fall down into the same state from which the speakers had just been delivered. Two others of my particular acquaintance from a distance were struck down. I sat patiently for one of them. I knew to be a careless sinner for hours and observed what critical attention, everything that passed from the beginning to the end. I noticed a momentary reviving as from death. The humble confession of sin, the fervent prayer, and the ultimate deliverance, and then the solemn thanks of praise to God, and affectionate exhortation to companions and the people around to repent and come to Jesus. I was astonished at the amount of gospel truth displayed in the address. The effect was that several sank down in the same appearance of death. After attending to many of such ones, my convention was complete that it was a work, a good work, the work of God, nor has my mind wavered since on the subject. Much did I see then that I considered to be fanaticism. But this should be not condemn the work. Fanaticism, it means it went too far. The devil always tries to ape the works of God and bring into them into disrepute, but he cannot be a satanic work which brings men to humble confession, to, uh, to forsaking sin, to prayer, to fervent praise and thanksgiving and sincere and affection, exhortation to sinners to repent and come to Jesus the Savior. Camp meetings once introduced into the plain 
spread like wildfire. After one another was held in rapid succession, the woods and all parts seemed alive with people and the number reported attending almost incredible. The fire baptized Methodist. Many people went to church that were lost. And under the conviction, under the, under the displays of great emotion, it affected them also. But the Spirit of God worked in spite of some of this. And there were many really true conversions. And some of them even became Baptists later as they studied the God, Word of God. Father, we send this message out that people might understand and might learn from, from history the history of this country that would not have been America without the Baptist churches. And Father, please forgive me, Raphael, and use this message for honor and glory. In Jesus' name I pray.